or if you have um, a copy of God's Word in front of you, whether that's uh, in, in book form or on your device, then please turn back with me to Mark's Gospel and chapter 12. The Christianity Explored course uh, begins with, with a question, and it's a, it's a well-known question if you've done uh, or if you're familiar with Christianity Explored. It goes like this. If you could ask God just one question, what would it be? I think that's a, an interesting question for us to think about. If you could ask God one question, what would it be? It may be something very personal to you. It may be something broadly philosophical. It may be something that um, you have heard often answered, but you're just not satisfied with the answer that has been given. Well, we've been going through in Mark's Gospel the last week of the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry before he is crucified. He is there in Jerusalem, and we saw on the first day he has been welcomed by the people's praises as he is ridden into Jerusalem on a colt, the foal of a donkey. On day two, he was in the temple and he cleaned it out by throwing out the money changers and preventing people from walking through it. And on day three, he has been receiving question after question after question. And, and the privilege these people had as the Lord had come to his temple and they were, had the opportunity to ask him any question that they had liked, any question. They had the teacher who taught with authority in front of them. They, 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 had, they had the one who could, who could speak to the, to the weather and it would do whatever he commanded it. They had the one who, with a word, could raise the dead back to life again. They had the one who, who constantly, they were astonished by the words that came from his mouth. They could have asked him any question they liked. And they chose questions that were insincere and that were designed not to learn, but to trap him. These uh, are coming to him in different groups. We, we saw first that the chief priests, the elders and the scribes in the temple, they came to him and asked him a question. And when he told them a parable about them, and they realized that it was about them and how they had taken God's servants and beaten them and treated them shamefully and in some cases even killed them, and that they realized that he had spoken about how they would take the Son of God and they would throw him out and they would try to, they would kill him. They, they went away and, and they, they, their, their work hadn't been done because, because they say in, in verse 12 of Mark chapter 12, well, uh, they, they were seeking to arrest him, but they feared the people for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. But verse 13 says, and they sent to him some others. So next we find the, the scribes and the Pharisees coming to, the, sorry, not the scribes, the Pharisees and the Herodians coming to him, these unlikely pairs of people, the Herodians who were irreligious, who, who supported King Herod, and then you had, and, and who supported the Romans, and the Pharisees who, who, were, who were against Herod's reign, and who didn't support the Romans, and who were very religious, and they come together in order to try and trap Jesus. But that doesn't work. They leave him, as he answers their question, marvelling. And now here comes a different group of people, the Sadducees. The Sadducees, verse 18, came to him. And, and we, we need to ask right from the get-go, who are the Sadducees? Because if you've been paying attention to Mark's gospel, you will realise that this is the only time the Sadducees are mentioned by Mark. This is the only time that the Sadducees come to the... Sh Come to, the, come to the front in Mark's gospel. This is the only time they're mentioned. And they get one question. And what is their question? Well, we'll see that in a moment. But I want to ask first, who are these Sadducees? Who are they? Well, uh, they were part of the ruling council in the temple. 
They, they were the, the sort of cohorts of the high priest. They had been in positions of both uh, privilege and wealth. They had power that was, that was unmatched, really. They were able to even have people arrested and thrown into prison. You see that in, in the Acts of the Apostles when, when they have Peter arrested. They, they also were no friends of the Pharisees. You see, they denied, Mark tells us, the resurrection, the resurrection of the dead. And the Pharisees did not deny the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees also, uh, Mark doesn't tell us this, but the Sadducees also rejected certain parts of the Bible, uh, they, the Old Testament. They only agreed that the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, were authoritative as the Word of God. They disagreed with the, the prophets and the his, history and the wisdom. They didn't accept them as, as canon. And so here's their one question, their one question. Let's look at the Sadducees' question. And, and it comes with three layers, three layers in this question which is asked by the Sadducees. Firstly, notice what they read in verse 19, what they read. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. So this is what they've read. Moses has written a law, and you can find this law in Deuteronomy 25 and verses 5 to 10. I'll, I'll tell you what it is all about. The, this is the law of Leverite marriage. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw two Latin phrases at you this morning, um, because just, just because I find it quite interesting. Lever means, uh, so the Leverite, the Lever of that is Latin for brother-in-law. So it's brother-in-law marriage, essentially. And, and you see, this law was written by Moses in a patriarchal society where there are very little provisions for women who are on their own. And so this law said that if a man marries a woman and he has a brother, and if, his, and if he dies, the brother is to then marry his widow and the firstborn son of that marriage union will take the name of the deceased brother. We find this incredibly strange. I don't know about you, but I, I still, every time I come across Leverite marriage, I find it very difficult to grab hold of. But it had benefits for the society in which it was given. Because this law in Deuteronomy 25 protected the vulnerable widow who, if left behind by her husband, would then have no other means of support. She would be penniless and left to herself. The law also ensured that the land which the family had inherited would remain in the family throughout generations. It was a very practical, um, very practical law given in a society which didn't have such services as NHS and, um, and welfare, welfare support. That's what they read. So they say, look, there's, there's this law. Teacher, teacher Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. They're going to make a biblical question. They're going to ask him something about the Bible. Every Bible teacher is thrilled when someone asks a Bible question. But the second layer, what they reasoned, verses 20 to 22, here it comes. There were seven brothers, they say. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. And the seven left no offspring, Last of all, the woman also died. Now, this, this, this line of reasoning that they're taking is, is often called a reductio ad absurdium. Basically, it means an absurd, a reduction to the absurd. 
They're taking what they've read and they're take, going to use an argument. They're going to reason this argument through, this bit of scripture, through to a, a logical conclusion. They're going, to re, they're going to use this to show that there is not a chance that the resurrection could actually be true. Because after all, God's word gives this law. And so imagine there are seven brothers, one marries, he dies. The next brother marries the widow, they, he dies. And all of them along the line, they go, seven brothers, all of them die, no offspring is left. No offspring left. And the question in the resurrection when they rise again, whose wife will she be? Notice that the seven is, is an interesting one because one theologian comments, seven signifies completeness. The number appearing at the very beginning of the Old Testament where God orders creation and completes his work in seven days. The Sadducees want to suggest how completely ridiculous the idea of resurrection is. So look at what they asked. Verse 23, in the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as wife, the sting in the tail. They took a while to get there, but they, this question is designed to trap Jesus. Their reasoning is designed to get an answer that Jesus would disagree with. And, and, to, and to trap him. You see, if Jesus denies the resurrection, then the people would say he denied the power of God. But if Jesus affirms the resurrection, the Sadducees would say he denied the word of God. You see the trap? And, and you know, uh, Peter tells us, doesn't he? Uh, he tells ordinary Christians in, in living in, in a world that that um, rejects the gospel, living in a world that can often be hostile to the gospel, Peter tells us be that we are always to be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And for, if we're wanting to be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks us for the reason for the hope that is in us, well, we need to be aware of questions like this. Where, where the Bible is selectively quoted in order to prop up a theological position or an ethical position. We're to beware of questions that where, where narrow human logic is used in order to dismiss the revelation of God, where, where they claim open-mindedness, but really uh, the, the, the mind is closed on, on things they disagree with. We need to beware of questions where, which presuppose there already is an answer. That they're not looking for you to, to give them an honest answer. They're not looking for, to, to be convinced. They're looking for, for you to be tripped up. They're looking for you to be trapped. They're, they're looking because they know the answer and they're hoping you're going to say something which is a bit like foot in mouth. Beware of questions like the Sadducees and beware of asking questions like the Sadducees. That's the Sadducees' question. Let's look at the Lord's answer. Because twice Jesus explicitly tells the Sadducees, and, and I find this incredibly interesting, they are wrong. Jesus, the man of love, Jesus who, who had answered the questions of the Pharisees and Herodians, Jesus, who, who had spoken in parables, who, who, who had spoken in parables to the chief priests, the, the elders and the scribes, now explicitly tells the Sadducees, you're wrong. I'm not even answering this question as you want me to. He says, you're wrong. In, in fact, he doesn't answer the, the question quite as we, we think because um, when he says, for when they rise from the dead, the, the, the original language is, is more general than their question is. He, Jesus doesn't talk about the seven and the widow. He talks about they. He's talking about those in front of him, those listening to him. They as in 
we. And he says to them, why are they wrong? Because, firstly, they did not know the Word of God. They did not know the Word of God. Look at verse, verse uh, 26 to 27. As for the dead being raised, as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You see, the, the teaching of resurrection, where do you find it in the, in the, in the Old Testament? You, you would struggle. There are various passages that may, may help you. Uh, if you go to the book of Job, Job talks about uh, the time where he will see his Redeemer with his eyes. Uh, and uh, beyond death, there's, there's a hint of resurrection there. But you see, in the, in the Old Testament, what you often find are truths that are in seed form. The resurrection was, uh, the teaching of the resurrection was like a seed in the Old Testament. But when it comes to the New Testament, when it comes to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, 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 these teachings that were in seed form in the Old Testament become fully bloomed in the New. And they can be seen in, all, in clarity. And Jesus takes them to the scriptures that they believed were the word of God. He takes them back to the book of Exodus and chapter 3. And he, he observes the tiniest detail within that passage where, where God spoke to Moses from the burning bush and where God had said that he heard the, and saw the groanings and suffering of his people. And, and God then speaks to Moses when Moses says, who shall I say that you are? And God says, I am. Present tense, not I was the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, but they're dead, they're gone, I'm now your God. He could have said that. But he says, not I was the God, but I am the God. I am the God of Abraham, of Jacob, and of Isaac. He's using present tense, and Jesus highlights this and finds this most interesting use of the Scriptures. He, he sees in the Scriptures that there, as God speaks to Moses, when God says, I am and not I was, that this is proof of resurrection. And more than that, you see, why does he quote Abraham, Isaac and Jacob? Why is he, he talking about, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? Well, because there is God appeared to Abraham, God appeared to Jacob, God appeared to Isaac, and God had said, made promises to each one of those. Promises about the land being inherited. Promises about them being a great nation. Promises about God blessing them. And, and Jesus sees within that, that sentence, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. A God who does not break promises. A God who does not just make promises for future generations, which will be seen by future generations, but he is a God who makes prom who, to those he makes promises to, even death cannot interrupt those promises. Even death cannot get in the way of those promises. That Abraham will inherit the land God had promised because the book of Hebrews tells us that Abraham saw by faith a land beyond the physical land. He saw the glories of heaven that he would possess. They did not know the word of God. They'd misunderstood it. They didn't see resurrection, so they didn't believe resurrection. But Jesus says that's because you do not know the scriptures. And they did not know the power of God. Look there in verse 25. I know the references on the screen, I've, I've got those wrong, so we'll have to correct those for the 11 and 4. But look at verse 25. For when they rise from the dead, Jesus says, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. The power of God. The Sadducees, by denying the resurrection of the dead, were denying that God had the ability to raise the dead. 
and that by denying the, the resurrection and using this logic that they had used to reason from the scriptures, a, 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 ridiculous, a ridiculous argument, they were denying that God could ever have a plan, that God would be wise enough and powerful enough to overcome those things that we find illogical and confusing and hard to understand in the scriptures. Marriage was given as a picture of Christ's union with his people, the church. What a gloriously beautiful picture it is. But as any picture, it's not perfect. And as any picture, it has its flaws and its failings. But nonetheless, it's a gloriously beautiful picture, not because it's a well-drawn picture, but because the picture points us to the reality, the glorious truth that Christ is the bridegroom of his people, the church, and that he is committed to her, and he has bought her with his own blood, and that he has, been, he has sacrificed his own life for her, and for her good. It's a glorious picture. And when the reality comes in the new creation, when the resurrection happens, the picture will no longer be center frame. It will no longer be the, the, the most necessary. Look what Jesus says. When they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. I want to say that's huge comfort for those who are single and longing for marriage, because there is a greater day that is coming. Every wedding where you've felt that pang, there's a greater day coming when the bridegroom will receive his church, the bride. And I want to say for those who are married, and that this verse brings trouble to, because you love your husband and you love your wife, and you think a future where we're not married? Well, I don't believe this verse is teaching that in the resurrection your relationship will be diminished in any way. If anything, I believe we can see from scriptures that our relationships with one another will be not diminished but deepened like never before. And there will be our saviour. And that will be, that will be enough. So what does this, what does this mean for us as we, see, as we see how the Sadducees were wrong? That they did not know neither the word of God, nor the power of God? Well, I want want us to take away, we we learn that there is a right way to read the Bible. There is a right way to read the Bible. Um, What do you do, for example, when you read the Bible and you find something that makes you feel uncomfortable? After all, this Bible is a big book, and it's got places that, that will make you scratch your head, feel uncomfortable, or possibly even um, you, may, you may find that you disagree with it. What do we do when we find something like that? Well, we need to realise every part, every detail of the Bible is revelation of God. And we affirm that it is without error. That if we find something wrong with the Bible, it's not because the Bible is wrong, in its representation of God or its, or its evaluation of humanity, but actually that we are wrong because we are sinners and our thinking has been, has been corrupted by, by, by sin and that we don't have all the answers and that we are not God and we, do, we, are, we are able and capable of error. And so when we find in the the scriptures the word of God, we find that we're uncomfortable or we disagree or or we we, we don't like something, then we, we, we don't seek to change the book. 
rejecting parts of it, accepting other parts by, by whatever reasoning we use. But we, we hold on to it and we lay it before God and we say, I do not understand this, but you are God. Uh, and help me, uh, we, we pray like Thomas, Lord, I believe, help now my unbelief. Because did you ever think of this? To disagree with the Scriptures means that we're disagreeing with Christ. Some would make the, the, the very noble notion that, well, I don't, I don't, I don't, um, I'm not a Christian, who, I'm not a, I'm not a Bible-believing Christian, I'm a Christ-following Christian. That I, 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 the, the Bible isn't, isn't primary, Christ is primary, and, and I, amen. Christ is primary. But you cannot have Christ without the Scriptures, because the Scriptures are the revelation of the Christ. And so the, the Scriptures do not need to change, but I need to change. And to disagree with the Scriptures means that I am disagreeing with the Christ of the Scriptures, who came to fulfill them, and who came and even believed them. Notice what Jesus does. I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. He takes a small detail and he says, this teaches the resurrection. That The Lord Jesus believed every part of the Scriptures. He believed even in tenses, being God-inspired. There is a right way to read the Bible. But we learn also that there is a right way to think about heaven. There is a right way to think about heaven. I wonder how do you imagine heaven to be like? Well, the Bible tells us there will be continuity and discontinuity. Unfortunately, we, we take a very Victorian idea of heaven, where we're, it's a very ethereal place, uh, where, where there, we're sort of, you know, sitting on clouds, strumming the harps, it's, you know, spirits floating around, disembodied. That's not the picture of the Scriptures, old or new. No, there will be continuity and discontinuity. You will have a body, you will have a body, that's continuity. But it will be a glorious and immort immortal body. It will be a body free from pain, free from suffering. A body, uh, you remember how Jesus, when he rose from the dead, how he could move from room to room but when the doors were locked? You will have a glorious and incorruptible immortal body. That's discontinuity. Your body will be recognisable. That's continuity. They recognised it was Jesus. It was different, but it was Jesus. And they recognised him. And your body will be recognisable. That's continuity. But it will be free from indwelling sin. And those, those character flaws and faults and failings that, that characterise you and make you recognisable will be gone. That's discontinuity. For you will see Jesus and you will be like him, for you will see him as he is. You will continue relationships with Christians you know now. It's continuity. Jesus didn't stop recognising or being in a relationship with his disciples. But these relationships will be without fracture or tension, and they will always be to the glory of God. That's discontinuity. How can you be sure of this? Well, because Jesus believed it. And he not only believed it, but he went to the cross. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. And so all those who trust in his, his death at the cross, which was a payment for our sins, and all those who, who, who call on his name, believing that he's ri risen from the dead and is alive today, can have this same hope of glory death is not the end. There is a resurrection to come. And this, this is great hope. This is great hope. This is our only hope, isn't it? Because some of you are suffering. Some of you are suffering. How did Jesus endure extreme suffering at Calvary while continuing to trust in God? Some of you are going through intense trials and periods of darkness and you don't, know the, you don't know what's at the end. 
and you're struggling to find if there's any hope or if there's any light at the end of the tunnel? How did Jesus persevere when his friends abandoned him, those he trusted? How did Jesus persevere when when people made up lies about him? How did Jesus persevere when they, they mocked him and beat him and nailed him to the cross and continued to jeer at him? It was his knowing the scriptures and the power of God to raise the dead. Look at this verse, Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 2. The writer of Hebrews says, Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of of God. Christian, this is your hope. I'm rather pleased the Sadducees asked this question. I'm more pleased they were wrong. What about you? Our final song speaks about the victory Jesus Christ has given us over the grave. Oh